Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 327. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today, we got Kevin Rakestraw. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Kevin's coming at us through the power of the phone because his mic <laughs> is... Cool. Yeah. That, that mic just died. If you guys can hear what Kevin sounds like through the phone, imagine that like a hundred times worse. And that's that's how it was. In fact, if you listen to Ryan watches a movie this week, you'll be able to hear what Kevin because because it, it actually started to die during that show. Yeah, so you can hear you can you can hear it die in real time. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna clean it up the best I can in editing, but there's not a whole lot that can be done with uh, no and with I, that episode. I and I think it's also really unfortunate because I think that did kind of like just derail that whole episode. I don't think we really fully recovered afterwards. I, I, yes, I somewhat agree with you there. It, it definitely, cause we, we were talking about some stuff and then we had a good flow and then like the mic problem happened and then we had to kind of stop and pick back up with the mic problem. And yeah, it, it, we never fully recovered from that. The the flow was gone. It got damned. Yeah. Got damned up. Yeah, that's why, like, for this, so we, we tested it. It was still sounding really rough, and rather than just trying to power through it, just had him call in old school. I like that to just be my calling card now, though. Just a shitty mic. <laughs> you just I'm use just your a- phone. <laughs> <laughs> Not even use a mic. Just use your phone every week. <laughs> just calling in all the time, dude. <laughs> why not? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to do something about that. Anyway, this week on the show, we'll be talking about Albert Bernie's Tux and Fanny, the movie, which is available <laughs> for free on Vimeo right now. We'll also be talking about someone watching on the watch list and going over this week's new releases in theaters, VOD and Blu-ray. Thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, you can help support Film Pulse on Patreon at patreon.com slash Film Pulse for just a dollar a month. Also, please consider reviewing us on iTunes. That is extremely helpful as well. Not a whole lot of housekeeping to get through today. Just as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, there will be a new Ryan Watches movie this week. Uh, He wanted a comedy, so we gave him a very contemporary comedy. Give that a listen and see if uh, he liked that. Uh, And that's pretty much it. We're Mm -hmm. Ken and I are formulating what we want to do for the June episode of Saved by the 90s. We have the topic um, and we're just putting the final touches on the, the movie selections. So we will have more on that uh, in the coming weeks. And I think with that, we can get into our review. No plot synopsis for this that I can see here. I have, I, I have one. Where's Talks this? And Fanny, it's off of Albert Bernie's website. Oh, okay. Tux and Fanny are two friends living together in the forest, and these are their adventures. Exclamation point. That's for the movie or just for the whole thing in general? For the whole thing in general. Oh, okay. They're just living together in the forest, having adventures. So so Albert Bernie, who we spoke about um, on this show before, we, we reviewed his last movie... Um, Silvio, his last mm-hmm. feature, his last feature, Silvio. Yeah. And we, we both liked that quite a bit. And mm-hmm. since, since Silvio, he's been doing these little short films, almost like a web series called Tux mm-hmm. and Fanny. And I've been enjoying them. I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen most of them. And then all of a sudden he announced that he was making a feature length movie out of Tux and Fanny. And then all of a sudden he just like surprise dropped it online and it was just available for free on Vimeo mm-hmm. like out, of, out of nowhere. It seemed. Yes. Now, Kevin, I take it. You were also familiar with the, the series Tux and Fanny. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, buddy. <laughs> Cause not only, not only did we, you know, we discussed, we, uh, Sylvia on the show. I think we had an episode for that one. Uh, his movie before that, The Beast Pageant, I covered as an unsung indie. 
and I've also watched a bunch of his other short films that he's done. You know, I'm a big Albert Bernie fan. Okay. So what did you think of the Tux and Fanny movie? The Tux and Fanny movie. Now, I'm, I'm with you where I've been following this on Twitter. You know, you'd be scrolling through Twitter and it'd be like, oh, new Tux and Fanny. All right. And you watch that bad boy because they're all what? Like, like I forget two what minutes. The, the, yeah. Like two minute max, maybe. Yeah. So, you know, like in the midst of your scrolling, you get this little break. You get to catch up with Tux and Fanny, see what they're up to. What new adventures are they? Are they, are they having together as friends living in the forest? And, uh, but I also, I don't think I caught every single one of them because I can't, I couldn't tell if he actually had like, like a schedule for releasing these, you know, the individual episodes things. They just kind of seem to come up at random. Yeah. So if you caught it, you caught it. If not, you just didn't really know about it. So it was, uh, enjoyable to have them essentially all compiled and put together as one one shot but i don't know if it works as well as it did with it being episodic in twitter form you know what i mean i completely agree with you so with his last feature sylvia that's based on a vine account and that was another thing where you're like these work as little bite-sized, you know, jokes on Vine, but how can we translate this into a feature length film? And I think w that with Silvio, it surprisingly worked. Like it was just, <laughs> he, he made that work and it was actually really enjoyable with Tux and Fanny. Uh, I, I still enjoyed it, but I feel like, this is the type of thing that is better suited for short form entertainment and not an hour and yeah. 20, 20 minutes because by the end I was just like, okay, like I've had enough and I don't, I don't, I don't want that to sound like it's necessarily a negative because I like almost everything about Tux and Fanny as a whole. I love the animation style, the sort of, 8-bit, like, old Commodore 64 computer style. I love the sound. The Like, one thing that I think can't be underscored enough is the the unique sound in this. Uh, like, like for instance, the like, when they found the chicken and the chicken was, like, feeding. It was just the sound of the chicken, like, bending over and picking up food off the ground. Like, I just loved all the sound. Yes, he uses some really interesting sound effects for a lot of the, you know, like the the one where it's just like an in, uh, a worm inching along yeah. on a leaf. But but the, also the thing that, that, that makes me, when I see that and I hear like those really weird sounds associated with things, it gives me this weird nostalgia for like back, back in the day, like when we were in elementary school and we would have like a uh, film strip day and we would watch these like really weird old educational cartoons and stuff. And like, that's, that's sort of how it sounded. And I really love that about this. There's this like added level of nostalgia, but also on top of that, the fact that Tux and Fanny seem to be Russian adds this other kind of weird layer where it, it's like, is, is this like an eighties? Like, are they behind the iron curtain? Is that what's happening? And this is like some kind of weird, uh, like, was it, yeah. Was this their cartoon? Yeah. Was this they some kind of like weird Russian cartoon? Uh, very just, I love that they, that that's part of it as well. Yeah. And how like yeah. everything, like like all of the text in the movie is like in Russian. So, uh, very, I just love the, the look. I love the aesthetic, everything about the style of this movie and how throughout the movie, they, they don't always do the eight bit style. They mix it up and there's like watercolors and there's like the, the, when, when everything turns to wood and, and yeah. they turn into these like cone <laughs> things, <laughs> like there's, there's just so much here that I really, that I really liked, but 
at the same time, I was just like, mm, it's it's not holding me for an hour and 20 minutes. Like, I just think that this would be better suited for smaller, even like 30 minute chunks. Which I think, you know, and that that is, it's the way it works best for me was like you're saying the the Twitter experience, you know, just catching it. And it was nice to hear having him collect it. And it was because, you know, back when this first started, when he first started doing these, which might be like over a year ago, I'm not 100% sure. But some of those early episodes, I kind of had forgotten when I started up the movie. So I'm, I'm with you where it was kind of losing me at the end, but I don't know if that was necessarily the film itself or it was because I was getting into more of territory where the episodes were still pretty fresh. Like I had seen them just a little bit ago compared to like the very beginning of the movie where it's like, Oh, I haven't seen these you know little episodes for like over a year now. I completely forgot that he lost all of his skin from <laughs> <Yeah>. fire ants. <laughs> and, uh, not only did he lose all of his skin, but then a chicken moved inside of him. <laughs> and I, I love how things had lasting consequences in, in this world. Like he loses all of his skin and that's just how it is. He's, he's like that for the rest of the time. Now they do knit him a replacement skin. So he does get the yeah. skin back, but it has a little hole in it. So the chicken can <laughs> It can pop its head <laughs> then out. Get the eggs out. Get yes. those eggs out. Yeah, and I I love the fact that Albert Bernie has such a, a an interesting way of just like developing characters and even like building relationships. Where like when he finally Tux finally gets rid of the chicken, lets the chicken out into the wild, and you can actually see that like it really affects him. He's mm-hmm. really bummed out that he doesn't have a chicken living in his rib cage anymore, which is, it's just like the way he's able to like create emotional connection between like the most ridiculous of things. It's a chicken yeah. that lives in his rib cage that has well, a hole in, in his skin suit so they can get egg. <laughs> I liked the scene when, um, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Tux or Fanny that started it, but they put, they had a spider on their face so that the, the spider could eat their tears. <laughs> I love the whole explanation about how like the spider is the angel and the tears are like the demons and the bad, the negativity leaving your body. And then you're having the angel suck up the negativity. Very and the, just cut, and just cut to Fanny sitting beside yeah, him with yeah. the spider. <laughs> with the <face>. spider. <laughs> I I love the the existential like dread that this movie and and the the series evokes. Like, there's some really yeah. a couple of the sequences. I found myself being very depressed afterwards. Like, oh god. <laughs> Like we're so alone in this, in this universe, (laughs) but there's some really kind of, for as silly and sort of absurd as Tux and Fanny is, they deal with a lot of really heavy uh, topics. And that's the, the, the interesting thing between Tux and Fanny is you have that juxtaposition of their personalities because Tux is always doing that like existential crisis pontificating. And then it's usually just Fanny after, you know, the long soliloquy or whatever. And Fanny just says something silly or does something silly. Like when Tux does the, the whole speech about the, the campfire and the, the flames raging and all that. And then it just pulls out and Fanny's like, I like to poke it with a stick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm, I also I like how their, their computer broke and their tv broke and then those those two things were just laying in their yard forever after after that happened and that was and that's the thing that i found 
thoroughly enjoyable within the context of it being episodic on Twitter. Like when I would catch it, it felt like, you know, like perfect timing. Like, oh, wow. Yes, a tuck and vanity because you had no idea one was going to come out. If one was going to come out, you didn't know how many he was doing. It would just kind of be a surprise. And then it had that, you know, the the through line where you had stuff that came back over and over. You know, the TVs, you you know, you see the TVs out there and be like, oh, yeah, that's right. Where, you know, the, what was his name? Julian, the, the turtle in the sky that plays the glockenspiel. Yeah. And that's how you're born. <laughs> yeah. You know, he shows up later. And the, the stuff with the cubes, uh, how Fanny starts seeing cubes. Seeing all the cubes time. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it, she was stuck in the computer for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's, they, they, they act as like really perfect little, like bite sized nuggets of entertainment that yeah, but they, 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 they get still... in, they get in real quick. They have, they have like, they're, fu- they're really funny and they have like kind of a, a topic for you to ponder. And I think that combining them all into this, into this movie, it's cool. I just don't know how much this works compared to having them in those bite-sized chunks. Yeah, but I think that it's still it's still a credit to him because if you think about it, he you he made you know all these episodes like how many seventy nine so you have seventy nine different episodes right that work perfectly as little bite sized nuggets like you said, mm-hmm. but then they also work well enough that you can just mush them all together yeah. one through 79 and watch all of them at this at once. And it works right. that way too, which I, you know, that that's kind of hard to do planning wise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really impressive. I mean, again, like I, the level of creativity and talent behind this, this movie and, and the, the, the web series is like just incredible. I, I, I really, Love everything about yeah. Tux and Fanny. And I just I just remember I'm remembering two things here. I love the idea of Fanny playing the video game Penguin Pusher. Yeah. And, and then, I don't, I don't and, know why, but <laughs> I, the the funniest part of that was when she goes over to Tux and he's standing on the chair trying to change the <laughs> light bulb and just cuts to him having his arm in the sling because <laughs> you know what she did. Just the look on her face. She pushed him. <laughs> and I also, you know, the one episode is just there are two cars. There are two cars driving around on a giant deer. Yeah. Yep. And they come up on the, the deer skull. That was the when they first revealed the acorn. The acorn yeah, inside the deer acorn. skull. And then he even had, you know, at the end, which, I mean, this is, to me, again, this is pretty damn cool, is where they had, you know, towards the end, they get to the beach, and they're talking about how there's so many different versions of them, different universes and everything. And then he actually put a call out to people, you know, hey, this is the scene, do your own artwork, and send it in to me, and I'll use it. And then it just, you know, it ends up just cycling through like 50 different you know, styles all created mm-hmm. by other people. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, they, they even did a live action. There was like a little live action part of it yeah. at one point where there was people that were dressed up in tux and fanny costumes. It wasn't that one that you mentioned. It was a separate episode, but, uh, um, yeah, just tons of really cool stuff. I loved the 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 whole um, story when when Tux left and it was just Fanny and she was so alone and she was just so lonely that she decided to make another <laughs> Tux and made him out of clay and she put him at the fire and he melted. <laughs> I liked that whole like how it kept falling over and then she wanted it to move so she put it on the record player. That's the other thing is the. He does his like little 
quick turns into just like darkness and it just gets really weird and dark and then it pops back out. Yeah. But it, it'll get really surreal and dark for a second. And then it's back to just being silly. I don't know where adult swim is at, but this feels like it'd be perfectly suited for adult swim. They need to pick this up. Yeah, but I don't, it, it doesn't seem like Albert Bernie works that way. I don't think so. I think he just does his own thing at his own pace. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a bummer because I'm like, I, I can see him. He's obviously going to move on to something else, but it's like, I would, I hope at some point we, we come back to Tux, Tux and Fanny. Cause I want to know what you're doing. I want to know what Tux and Fanny are up to. Yeah. I want more Tux and Fanny. I'm just, I'm, I'm being selfish now. I just want more. Give it to me. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, I want to see this. I think he is planning a, uh, DVD or Blu-ray release of this. Cause I think I did. Okay. I think I read something on Twitter where he was looking for people to, to write like essays to include in, in the Blu-ray release, you know, sort mm. of like, sort of like what criterion does and like arrow. And yeah. So I think that there is an impending release of this on uh Blu-ray. He does have it on VHS right now. Oh, you want to pick up a VHS for 20 bucks. Oh, that's even, that's cool too. Yeah. Which I have a feeling watching this on a VHS is like this, the main way you should probably see it. Yeah, I think so. It's worn out after 15 years of use. Bad tracking. Yeah. Lo- lo-fi scan lines, all that stuff. Yep. That's just going to add to it. Yep. Uh, all right. That's Tux and Fanny. Uh, I don't, I don't know if we need to give this a score. Let's 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 score uh, each uh, each episode all seventy nine. So each let's of the seventy nine. Start with <laughs> start with new friends. What would you give new friends? I'm not sure where that oh, one yeah. ends, but probably like a nine. <laughs> okay, there we go. Or nine, and then what we'll do is each individual rating. We'll just average those. 79 ratings together to come up with your your overall rating yeah that sounds like a whole thing that i don't want to be a part of (laughs) that is a whole thing so sit tight people the rest (laughs) of this episode (laughs) the rest of the episode it's going to be non-stop (laughs) math numbers lots of numbers (laughs) figuring out what episode like oh what happens in this episode do a breakdown of each Giving one. Giving that a number. I'm gonna go ahead and open up Google Sheets real quick. Start this spreadsheet. <laughs> okay, get those formulas ready. Might want to build some macros so we can uh, make this a little easier. I, mean, I might make a pivot table. I might fuck around and make a pivot table. Oh shit! Here we go. Uh, Tux and Fanny again. That is on Vimeo right now. Just type in Tux and Fanny. You can it'll pop up right there. It's like an hour and twenty two minutes. Give it a look. Yeah. yeah, give it a look. I mean, you can watch all sorts of places. You can watch the individual ones on Instagram or Twitter. Yeah. I think it's easier on Instagram. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But this is an interesting thing because this ended up, Tux and Fanny, as it were, when it was the individual episodes, was on my year-end top 50 list. And now it gets to be on it again. Because it's going to be on it again at the end of the year. Just a heads up. Spoiler. Yeah, sure. So back to back. Back to back years. Tux and Fanny. Nice. Let's move on and talk about someone watching on the watch list. Uh, I saw The Last Black Man in San Francisco. I have a review for this up on the site right now. This, As of right now, this is my number one movie of 2019. Ooh. Yeah, not going to bury the lead there. I loved this movie. It's directed by Joe Talbot. I had a feeling since that first trailer dropped, I was like, oh man, this is, this movie is immediately speaking to me. I'm going to love this. I just know I'm going to love it. And uh, I really I really did love it. It, um, it does drag a little bit. Maybe towards like the middle or like towards towards the like three quarter mark, like when the conflict of the movie starts to 
really st- sort of build up, I feel like it does drag. Like it, the pacing sort of slows a little bit. Uh, but even though it stumbles a little bit during that point, it recovers very quickly at the end. If you're not familiar with this, it's a movie about two best friends who live in San Francisco and one of one of them, it's like his dream to move back into his childhood home and he gets the opportunity to move back into that home. So him and his best friend, Montgomery, who is a uh, an artist and a playwright, they move all their stuff in and they fix up this home and uh, s- some other things happen. Highly recommended. Uh, am- amazing music in this. The score is just out of control. It's so good. It's on Spotify now, by the way. Performances across the board are are incredible. I mean, this this is a feature debut from Joe Talbot. Jimmy Fails, who uh, wrote the screenplay and he stars in it. This is like his first acting. He I think he was in a short film from Joe Talbot, but this is like his first major role. He's great in it. And I I think that it's based on events from his life too, but I think so. I think you're right. Highly, highly recommend seeing the last black man in San Francisco. This is playing in limited release right now. I'm not sure what the like full release schedule of this is, but a 24 is putting it out. So hopefully it'll make its way uh, to wherever you are shortly. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm amped for this one. I'm excited. It's really funny, too. Uh, I should mention that it is, I would call it a comedy. There's a lot of humor in it. Just got to wait for it to come out on streaming. Yeah. Because I did like when you were like, it comes out this weekend. Is it playing? And I just laughed. I laughed for like two minutes straight. I, I knew, like, as soon as I said it, like, I was, I was pretty sure. I was like, well. Let's just try it. The only reason I, I even asked if there was a possibility it was coming out is because it was A24. And they, yeah. but then as soon as I looked and saw that it was only playing in like two theaters in New York, I was like, oh boy, that's, that's yeah. definitely a limited release. <laughs> no, that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. A24 is weird because they're, they're, they're rollouts. Just, they're a bit odd sometimes. Yeah, you know what I mean? some like, stuff they just them, blast to everybody, and some they they hold back. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. It's weird. I, it's understandable for some some releases. Like this movie, this isn't going to appeal to everyone. Like it's it's a little bit of a niche title. Like it's kind of weird. It's a little quirky. It's it's a lot headier than you know most typical mainstream stuff. More arty, middle America. Arty. Middle America just won't wouldn't be into this. I don't think. Well, I have one that Middle America would also not be into, and that's the latest from Nathan Silver, The Great Pretender. This is currently playing on Amazon Prime. Just popped up out of nowhere. Amazon Prime. You can watch it there. This is, uh, you know, it's good. Nathan Silver doing his thing. Highly enjoyable. It's about a this female playwright who is French woman. She's working on this play based on her relationship with a, a guy played by Linus Phillips. If you remember Linus Phillips, of course. Yeah, he plays this plays this guy named Nick. He's a real piece of shit. He's just awful. So she's you know kind of developing this play. She has actors involved. Esther Grell plays her, and then Keith Polson plays uh, Linus Phillips' character. And then, you know, they start, things start overlapping. You know what I mean? They start influencing each other because they want to get into the headspace of these characters. So they get into their lives, and then things just get, whew, things get out of hand. Everyone's involved with everyone. Everyone's everyone's a bit uh, bit uh, over the top. Keith Paulson's also like a piece of shit, so he re- I guess he really understands Linus Phillips' character because they're both pieces of shit. 
And the the funniest thing with Nathan Silver is that, I mean, they start out as not good people, right? But he kind of holds some things to his chest about them that he reveals much later in the movie. And he just, it doesn't, he just does so in a very like nonchalant, just like a very subtle, or well, not really subtle, but just matter of factly, like, oh yeah, by the way, this person has a wife. And you're just like, what? This guy's been married the whole time? And then a little bit later, you know, just dropped it. Oh yeah, he has a kid too. <laughs> it's just like, it just made you like, you know, you already thought that this guy was kind of a piece of work, a real piece of work. And then you just learn that stuff and you're like, wow, it's like, it takes it to a whole nother level. Like I thought he was kind of like, like low level piece of piece of work, but he's, he's up the ladder. He's up the food chain there. The only thing that felt a little bit off for me was the ending. The ending kind of fumbled it a little bit, but, and it also has a lot of the kind of the visual style of Thirst Street where everything kind of has that haziness. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of scenes that kind of like shot in like almost like a kaleidoscope where there's like four different people, you know, so it, it, it's visually interesting throughout and the performances are great. It's pretty damn funny. They're awful people. Just the ending, just the ending a little bit, but I would definitely recommend it. All right. And that's on Amazon prime. The great pretender by Nathan silver. Didn't even know this was uh, coming out. Yep, same here. I had no idea. <laughs> Was not aware of that. <laughs> this is this is uh, something I learned on Twitter. I mean, you know, once in a blue moon, Twitter just really comes through. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I saw Dark Phoenix. This is the new X Men movie directed by Simon Kinberg. Uh, this is not good at all. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, this is not good. This is probably one of the worst X-Men movies to ever be released. It's wow. it's not as bad as X X3. X3 was like really bad. Mm-hmm. That's it, not not that bad, but it's pretty bad. Like I it didn't surprise me that there was like there was some marketing behind this, but I felt like they weren't really pushing it super hard. And I was kind of, so I kind of had a weird feeling about it. And then they did one press screening here in New York and it was the, the embargo, the review embargo lifted Wednesday and movies come out in New York on Thursday. So I knew that was not a great sign either. And it was, it was rough, man. The it's boring. It's boring. Mm. It's it's based on arguably one of the best uh, X Men story arcs. It was taken from the the cartoon, the Fox cartoon, the Dark Phoenix Saga, or maybe it's just called the Phoenix Saga. Whatever. They eventually adapted that. I believe it was Chris Claremont was one of the uh, the the people who adapted that into. The comic books uh and it was just a really great x-men story i think it was one of one of my favorites and um the <laughs> adapting it into this movie uh just it just didn't work it felt like a lot of the soul just kind of got sucked out of the story and you know it's supposed to be the epic conclusion to the to the x-men story and and like people just die and you, you don't, you don't care. You don't feel that weight. Um, and the whole movie is essentially just them sort of chasing after Jean gray, trying to talk to her. And it's like, not, there's not that many action scenes. Uh, the characters have very little to do like this, this really great ensemble is just wasted. And you, mm. you have like some big characters, you know, fan favorites that end up leaving in the first scene and you're just like, okay, well, they're gone. (laughs) And it's just like, what? Um, very disappointing. Just if it felt everything about this movie felt very lazy. It felt like that they were like, they knew 
that Disney bought them already. So they were just like, let's just finish this thing. Like they, they were all under contract. So they just had to get it done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's very bad. I can't recommend seeing Dark Phoenix. Wow. Well, the only other thing I saw was everybody knows it's the latest by Asgar Farhadi. <clears throat> and this was, uh, this was a disappointment. First mm. off, it's 132 minutes. Doesn't need to be. <laughs> That's my expertise critique. Doesn't need to be 132 minutes. Um, it's Penelope Cruz goes back to Spain with her family uh, and for her sister's wedding and her daughter gets kidnapped. And then the rest of the movie is just them trying to get the daughter back. But it's all, like with most Farhadi movies, there's a secret. Some people know, some people don't. As the title tells you, apparently everyone does. It's that, and it's, they don't even really do a good job of like, it's like you know immediately what the secret is, right? So there's really no attempt at, at least I couldn't see any. I couldn't, I couldn't really, nothing stood out to me as an attempt to like, try and tr create tension of, you know, someone finding out what the, what the secret is or what the secret isn't, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just, everything just feels really flat because there's so much of this you know, kind of like unspoken, like posturing of not, not, uh, not giving off too much information, which, I mean, your daughter's been kidnapped. <laughs> Who fucking cares? Like you, like who cares if someone finds out like what this what this secret is? Like you, you know, the biggest thing here is that you're trying to get your daughter back. Like it doesn't have a huge impact on whether you get your daughter back or not. Yeah. So, just who cares? But there's no tension, and they spend so much of the time on this of like, you know, them kind of tiptoeing around it. And it's, you know, they're doing that for 132 minutes. And you're like, we know what it is. Like, this isn't, you didn't really do a good job of concealing this. So it just all feels very unnecessary. So, gotta say, I didn't really like it. Mm, oh, that's a bummer. Uh, I saw The Beach Bum by Harmony Corinne. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, not into this. <laughs> I can tell just by that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to really love this cuz I I like most of what Harmony Corinne does. I've I've liked most of his movies. I I loved Spring Breakers, like loved it. I think it was my number one movie uh the year it came out. And um so I was pretty pretty stoked about The Beach Bum. I missed it when it was in theaters. So I finally saw it and um at the end i was just like okay that was all right that was okay the, it, the thing is it's exactly what you expect it is like there's nothing there's no surprises it's just it is literally just matthew mcconaughey just going around town being a beach bum like drinking just him just drinking and doing drugs that's that's what this movie is 95 yeah. minutes of matthew mcconaughey being a cool be a cool laid back beach guy. Mm -hmm. And, and like they put some, there's some narrative in here. Like he, he's like rich. He's like this rich writer, but it's his wife who has most of the money and she ends up dying. And uh, like, he can't get the money, his inheritance from her until he, uh, he finishes his novel. So he has to finish his novel and, you know, oh, he like, like there's, there's just a scene where he has to go to rehab for a year and then he meets Zac Efron, whose character is freaking hilarious in this. Uh, and they break out of rehab in like the first day that he's there. Uh, what is Zac Efron? Oh, his, his character's name is Flicker, Zac Efron. Jimmy Buffett's in it which I think is hilarious because I think in a lot of ways, this movie sort of 
it's not poking fun at, at that like beach culture, but it, it's certainly like putting a mirror up to it and being like, this is kind of, this is kind of ridiculous. But I love the fact that Jimmy Buffett is, is in this playing himself. And of course you have, uh, Isla Fisher is his wife and then Snoop Dogg's in it as well. Uh, as is Martin Lawrence. Martin Lawrence plays a, a, a guy who takes people out on boat, uh, dolphin watching tours and he just loves dolphins. He loves dolphins so much. Yes. And his name's Captain Whack. <laughs> I want, I want that movie. That's the movie I want. The Captain I want Whack. A of just Martin Lawrence taking people out to look at dolphins. Yeah, something kind of surprising happens with that. And Jonah Hill's in it. He plays um, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character, his uh, manager, Moondog's manager. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's certainly, it's funny. You know, there's, there's certainly humor to be had in here. There were uh, quite a few moments that made me laugh, but ultimately at the end, I was just like, all right, like it came and it went and it was fine. I didn't have many problems with it, but it just sort of meandered around and it entered my life and then it left and it, it didn't really leave any kind of impact on me. Hmm. But it is certainly a love letter to like the beach I mean, when you when you think of the beach, like all the kind of tacky shit you see at the beach, and all the people that that live it at the beach, I think that Harmony Korine is just so perfectly in tune with those people and that culture that he can just very easily make a movie that that takes place there, and it feels very real and authentic. Anyway, that's the beach bum. The beach bum. That's disappointing. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's like, all right. Yeah, well, that's all I got. That's it. Okay. I got those. They, I got three. I got three this week. Not bad. Um, I'll quickly mention the Lego movie to the second part, uh, which I saw this weekend. It's, uh, I, this is another one where I enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. I didn't think it was at the same level as the, the first one. They expand on a lot of the stuff that happens in the first one, but a lot of it feels like sort of just a little little bit of a retread to me. The animation is still incredible, uh, but it doesn't quite have the same magic that the first one had. But I would give it a light recommend. Um, I also okay. saw Double Impact starring Van Damme. Never saw this yes. before. 1991, directed by Sheldon Ledich. This is the one where Van Damme it plays twins in it. He plays Chad and Alex. And yeah. <laughs> it's uh, this movie's so ridiculous. Um, the the folks at MVD, so they released this on the MVD Rewind collection, and uh, the folks at MVD were kind enough to send me a copy for review and. <laughs> Um, it is, it is just utterly ridiculous. And I kind of, I kind of loved it. It's a, it's a terrible movie, but it's really fun to watch. And, um, the, the, the Blu-ray has a two hour making of documentary and it has like the whole cast, the whole crew. It's pretty impressive. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe check out double impact on the MVD rewind collection. I love that they're, I, we've talked about them before and I, I like that they're, they exist, you know, like arrow handles, like kind of classic seventies, eighties horror movies, like especially ones that lean towards like Italian horror and stuff, but there's nobody really handling the like nineties action movie. And yeah, I feel like a lot of them are just sort of disappearing. And, um, that seems to be where this MVD rewind collection is coming into play and they're they're picking up a lot of these i mean like double impact that's an mgm movie and they still got the the rights to like release it and stuff so they have a lot of cool stuff that's really all i have this week 
All right, let's talk about some new releases in theaters this week. We've got a couple biggies. Men in Black International coming out. Ooh. What do you think about this one? Uh, indifferent. Yeah. I just, I, I haven't of... watched a Men in Black movie since the first one, I think. I uh, I didn't like part two. I like I did like part three actually. I was surprised at that one, but the I'm also indifferent about this one. There's a lot of people that I like in it, but from the trailers, I'm just like, meh. It looks like another Men in Black. It could be fun, but whatever. Yeah. We also have Shaft coming out. This is the. The new one with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and uh, who plays his son? Uh, Jesse T. Usher plays J.J. Shaft. And, of course, you have Robert Roundtree in there playing Shaft Sr. So you got three generations of Shaft in there. Okay. Again, no, no real expectations for this one. It could be fun, but eh. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Uh, the Dead Don't Die is coming out. Jim Jarmusch. <laughs> we- Heard uh, surprising things. Surprising yeah. things. Not only, like, I wasn't that surprised that, like, people didn't like it, but I've seen a number of people saying that it's, like, one of the worst things that they've seen. Uh, no, come on. It's it's definitely not. Okay. I think I think that there's certain expectations people might have going into it, and when it doesn't meet or exceed those expectations, or it's not exactly what they thought it was, it it really turns them off. And to be clear, there were there were things in this movie that I did not that I wasn't on board with. The there's certain things that happen that. I could totally understand somebody just being like, no, that is ridiculous. Sorry. I'm just not on board with this, but I still thought it was the, the, uh, the comedy and it still really landed for me. So I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it either. Gotcha. Um, let's see what else we have in theaters this week. Uh, Hampstead is coming out in the aisles. We got American Woman, Headcount, Being Frank. That's a comedy with Jim Gaffigan. Uh, Our Time. That's the... Um, uh, uh, Regadas? Yeah, the Carlos Regadas Dang, movie. Finally. Yeah. I feel like that's been a long time coming. Daughter of the Wolf. And it looks like that's pretty much it for this week. On VOD, let's see what we have. This is on June 10th. We have High Death. It's H-I, like High Death. I think it's supposed to be like High Def, but it's High Death. Ah, I gotcha. Clever. It's from the makers of of High 8 Horror Independent 8. What? <laughs> <From the> who? <laughs> high eight. High eight. Colon. Horror independent eight. What? Oh my god. What, well, what is happening here? I got uh I, It's I, like a VHS ripoff. That's what that looks well, like. Well, I'm looking it up and adding it to my watch list. Is that also <laughs> high as in high def? Or, yeah, uh, or yeah. what is it? High eight? High eight, you know, like the camera. Yeah. High, but then it's colon horror independent eight. So You're damn right it is. So they're saying like it's high eight, but it also so so it's a double meaning. It could refer to the you know the camera type, but it also stands for horror independent eight. Something also tells me that that, that was probably not shot on high eight. No, but it does have. Eight separate directors. Okay, there you go. So there's the. So these guys are clever. Many, many, all kinds of meanings happening with that with that title. Wow. Now, high death. I'm not sure how that one. Well, how that well, one works. High death. 
but it's uh, the same concept. It's a horror anthology. Oh boy. Anyway, on the eleventh, we have Ice and Ice on Fire. This is the HBO documentary um, that's produced and narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio. It's the envir- the environmental doc. Okay. Uh, we have Do Something, the Jeffrey Modell story. Oh yeah, oh, I think. Yeah. It, or it's, I guess it's Modell. I'm I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. What did he do? Did he direct one of the high eight, high independent eight shorts? What's this story? Uh, What's he doing? I'm looking here. He uh, Jeffrey Modell was a kid who, um, had primary immunodeficiency, a disorder of the the immune system. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately he passed away at the age of 15 and as a result, his parents, Fred and Vicky turned to their enduring love for each other to find the strength to fulfill their promise to Jeffrey. And they ended up like starting up a, um, like a foundation in his name. Okay. Also on the 11th, we have hallowed grounds. It's a horror movie. Before homosexuals, uh, from ancient times to Victorian crimes. Ooh. It's a documentary about the uh, the olden days gotcha. of um, same-sex love. Gotcha. Could be interesting. Uh, Crisis Hotline, that's uh, another horror movie. And then on the 14th, we have Pause, uh, Head Count, Midnight Runner, Murder Mystery is going to be on Netflix. That's the Adam Sandler one with uh, Jennifer Aniston. Mm. Back again. Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Dude, Doing... all the... Anytime I hear Adam Sandler and Netflix, all I can think of is you cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll definitely be a, a weekend cleaning watch for me. <laughs> Uh, another comedy that's coming out on Friday is Plus One. I I saw this recently. I, I can't even remember what <laughs> festival that was at, but I, I saw it at a festival very recently, and it was pretty good. It's pretty funny. Okay. Definitely made me laugh, so I'd give that a look. Hampstead uh, Vault is coming out. Looks like a, it's a heist movie about a, about a vault. Got to break into that vault. <clears throat> Inspired by a true story. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, they're difficult. They're difficult to break into. Yeah. Well, they're tricky. Yeah. I mean, they're designed that way. But, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much their their main function. Is yeah. to not be broken into. So when you do, uh, it does seem to make sense to make a movie about it. Yeah, of course. Uh, Deep Murder comes out. This is a horror comedy that... Just by looking at the poster, it looks like a absolute treasure. Ooh. Stars, stars uh, uh, Jerry O'Connell there. Oh boy, and he's got a wicked soul patch. Yes, it's a genre bending horror comedy that takes place inside the world of a soft core porn. No oh, boy. Yeah, that's it's there gonna go. be. It's gonna be awful. That's just gonna yeah. be a downright awful movie. Yeah, it's going to be a bad experience for anybody involved. <laughs> um, on Blu-ray this week, I got a got a few things here. Captain Marvel is coming out, so if you haven't seen Captain Marvel, maybe uh, maybe give it a look. Who knows? It's not horrible. Okay. Uh, Piranha from nineteen seventy eight is getting a steel book release. Looks like a lot of steel books are coming out this weekend. Johnny Quest, the complete series. This is the original 1964 Johnny Quest. Really? I, I was a huge, huge fan of Johnny Quest back in the day. Okay. I loved that show. Uh, the Entity from 1982 is getting a Blu-ray release, Collector's Edition. Shout Factory is releasing Jeffrey from 1995. That's with uh, Patrick Stewart and uh, uh, Stephen Weber. Sigourney Weaver. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Leprechaun Returns from last year. Hit in the old blue. I'd probably skip that one. I'll tell you, there's like there's like half of one good Leprechaun movie in existence. They're they're all just so bad. <laughs> Devil's Kiss from 1976. Uh, Final Stab from 2001. The Warriors from 1979 is getting a new Steelbook edition. Oh, yeah. Captive State. Captive State was one that kind of just came and went. That was one that like crept up out of nowhere. Like I wasn't even familiar with what that was when I started seeing trailers for it. I still want to give it a look, but well, now, now is the time. Yeah, no excuses. Uh, Kidnapped from 1971, starring Michael Caine. Oh, Michael Caine doing some kidnapping. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh, pop star never stop never stopping. That's getting that. a steel book too. I need to see that. You one. do need to see that. I yeah, do. it's it's great. Uh the the steel book looks really cool too. I don't know if I need to see the steel book version. I think no, I need no, to see no. the, the ho hum. Just the regular. Yeah. Just the old regular pick up the DVD at giant. Yeah, that or just stream it. I could stream it, I guess, yeah. It's probably on some some of the service. You would think. I don't know. I bet you it's not. Uh, maybe not. Five feet apart from earlier this year coming out. Just, it seems like I, I don't want to make this longer, but it seems like you've been listing DVDs for like the last 45 minutes. Uh, no, not DVDs. I mean, like the just a lot of other regular releases and stuff. There's a lot of VOD titles this week. Uh, the Mustang from 2019 coming out. The Mustang. The yeah. That? The 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 one with um uh Matthias uh, Schwernartz. Yeah. It's not the car. The mu- it's a but a horse like the horse the Mustang. The Mustang horse. Story of a violent convict who is given a. The chance to participate in a rehabilitation therapy program invol- involving the training of wild Mustangs. Oh, okay. He always seems to play a, a guy with a, a, with a violent nature that needs to get rehabilitated. Seems that way, yeah. Evil Bong 666 is coming out on Blu-ray. <laughs> and Evil <laughs> Evil Bong 777 is coming out on Blu-ray. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I loved I loved that the sequel was seven seven seven. I don't I just think that's very funny. Um that's pretty much it. There's a whole bunch of re releases and stuff, but nothing else worth uh mentioning. <clears throat> what about Criterions this week? Well, we got one and it's not as good as Evil Ball seven seven seven. But it is, it's uh, George Stevens' Swing Time from 1936 with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And interesting thing here, I've actually seen this movie. Nice. And it's pretty good, except I'm not, I'm not a, a, a Fred Astaire guy. I don't like Fred Astaire. He annoys me. I don't really have an opinion one way or the other, honestly. Well, I want you to watch Fred Astaire movies and then get back to me. Because for yeah, whatever I mean, reason, I, it's just something about him just rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, truthfully, I'm not sure how many of his movies I've seen over the years. No, oh, well. Uh, all right. I think that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulse.net and at filmpulsekevin. And if you have a minute, take a look at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash filmpulse. Consider helping us out by becoming a subscriber. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name's Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week.